Well, good morning and welcome to church. So glad that you chose to join us on this Father's Day. It's Father's Day and we want to focus on our dads and our father figures, but we also want to focus on our Father in Heaven who loves us unconditionally. Thank Father God for sending the Lord Jesus Christ, His one and only begotten Son, that we might have eternal life. What a gracious act of love from our eternal Father. May the Holy Spirit be with us as we worship in spirit and in truth. I have one announcement that I'd like to share with you. We are making plans to gather together at our facility here at Piney Grove United Methodist to gather together on July the 5th. That is the first day that we hope to have everyone come together for corporate worship. Because it is Independence Day weekend, we're going to do worship decidedly different. We will be gathering together on the West parking lot. It will be an outdoor worship venue, 8.30 in the morning on July 5th. You drive up, there will be chairs set up for social distancing. You're also invited to bring your own chairs, if you would prefer, for an outdoor worship service on July 5th. So pray for us that the weather might be beautiful and we can once again come to gather together as the body of Christ. For now, let's worship in spirit and in truth and in Jesus' name. of God say thank you Father. Thank Y'all are welcome to have a seat. No matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. No, -uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> My dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2. 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 My 
my dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. Hey guys, it's Miss Christine with Piney Grove Kids. I'm so excited to be with you here today. I want to wish all of the dads and all of the father figures out there a very, very happy Father's Day. And I would like to wish my own dad a wonderful and special day. Daddy, I love you and I miss you so much, but I'll see you in a few weeks. And I can't wait to sit and drink coffee with you early in the morning before anyone else gets up. That's our special time together, and I'm looking forward to it. So happy Father's Day, Daddy. Speaking of Father's Day, we have a very special guest with us here today. My good friend Chris McGee is with us. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, Chris is one of our third, fourth, and fifth grade Sunday school teachers, along with Brenda Cochran. Chris answered the call to serve in this capacity um, probably two years ago, Chris? Two years ago. Two years ago, and there has been no looking back. Chris is such a blessing to that age group. Um, I know he's got some hilarious stories about that age group, but Chris and Brenda are just faithful, faithful servants and are here on Sundays to teach the Word to our children. So I thought with it being Father's Day weekend, we would welcome Chris today to share one of his favorite. Bible verses with us. Thanks so much for being with us here oh, today, thank Chris. You. I, I really enjoy this. Uh, it's it's great. I miss my te- I miss my kids. I'm so ready to see y'all again. Um, and, and I just want to share a, a verse that I thought was uh, very appropriate for the weekend. Uh, it, you know, all my kids will tell you I'm probably going to share the one about honor your father and mother, but I'm not going to do that today. I love that. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, this is more geared towards the, the dads, believe it or not. It's, it's Proverbs 22, verse 6. It's direct your children unto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. And for me, it hits really hard home. Um, wasn't always the best kid, but I had a dad that, that kept me in line, that, that taught me the way of God and, and, and the way of Jesus, and it, it just helped me to become the person that I am today that my father, dad love you, uh, that he came out and, and taught me everything that, that got me to, to, the, to walk the right path. Amen. What a beautiful verse to share. Chris is so correct in that those fathers and father figures, whether it was a coach, a Sunday school teacher, um, a pastor Absolutely. who pointed you in that right direction. Uh-huh. And um, I have the pleasure of also knowing Chris's father, who is an amazing man. And I have the pleasure of knowing Chris's daughter. And he has definitely pointed his own child in the right path. Um, I, I just, try. <laughs> he says he tries. That's all we can do, right, Chris? That's right. But um, what's so neat about how Chris came to teach Sunday school, he answered the call on a Sunday. Scott just reached out to the congregation and said, we are in need of a Sunday school teacher for the third, fourth, and fifth graders. And before service was even over, Chris found me down the hallway and he said, God is leading me. And Chris told me these words that I will never forget. He said, I need this more than the kids probably do. And isn't that so cool that sometimes in our lives we are going through something where we need what others can just fill us with, and Chris does that for us each Sunday. Absolutely. I think I get more out of it than the kids do. Awesome. Really do. Well, Chris, happy Father's Day Thank to you. Thank so you. We are so blessed to have you. Thank you for sharing that oh, beautiful thank you. message. Thank you. Um, I hope all the kids out there are having a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. We're here in the prayer chapel at Piney Grove. It is a nice, quiet place, a place where I can come and listen to God and also speak to God. And these days, there are a lot of things I would like to say to God. The headlines in our newspapers, the editorials, all that we see on the television and read online regarding 
Racial reconciliation has many of us so frazzled. Uh, this one editorial cartoon shows the depiction of the base of a monument, a Confederate monument, with that monument taken down, but the base remaining. And underneath is a root system. And in the root system, there is a sprig growing up on the other side of the monument base. Because unfortunately, we cannot eradicate racism. Racism, this is, we're different. There are some folks that are always going to think differently. But here's the truth. We are made in the image of God, all of us. Red, yellow, black, white, tall, short. We are all God's children. And when we finally get to understand that, we will begin to treat each other differently. But the point is to focus on God. God, our Heavenly Father. And I, I pray we all get our focus back to God. I believe if we do that, focus on our Father in Heaven. Racial reconciliation will begin. Until that, it's going to continue to be a political hot topic. I'd rather it be a spiritual, peaceful topic. So speaking of our Father in Heaven, this is Father's Day today. and I want to encourage you to pray for your fathers or your father figures, whether they're absent from your life or still existent. And I do want to remind you to utilize our daily devotional book, The Upper Room. You can pick up a copy in the Breezeway at our church. This week, there were two installments, one on Thursday and another today on Sunday, that have to do with remembering those father figures in our life and how important they are to us. As a matter of fact, during this service, you're going to see some of the videos that have been sent in uh, reminding us of the presence of dads or those father figures in our lives. As we go into our time of prayer, I'd like to say a word of appreciation for the few dads that I've had around. My father's been gone almost 20 years now, so his memory is still strong, but there are men that have stepped up to the plate and have helped to mentor me. My uncle, Dave Durham, he's a good understanding fellow, and right now he's suffering from dementia, so I want to pray for my uncle Dave and my aunt Betty. I'd also like to pray for Mildred Rhodes, who lost her husband, Dusty Rhodes, many, many years ago. Dusty was a spiritual mentor to me, a person here at Piney Grove that helped guide me as I started to explore spirituality in a deeper, deeper way. He helped me with my initial walk with Christ. And finally, I'd just like to say a special word of appreciation to a man that's part of our congregation, and his name is Robert Landrum. Robert and Dorothy have been great encouragers here with the ministry that we have called Wednesday Night Fellowship. But more so than that, outside of church, much time spent on the golf course with, with Mr. Robert. Such words of encouragement and just, I guess, fellowship. So I want to say how much I appreciate those men in my lives. Perhaps you have some fellows that you would like to give thanks to as well. Let's appreciate them now as we go into a time of prayer. Father God, and you are our Father, we come to you in our moments of crisis and we ask for you to be there for us. We also come to you in our times of joy and elation and say thank you, Father, for what you have done. Because you are our loving Father in heaven, we have received the love that you have given to us. And we have received those men in our lives that have made a difference in our life. Thank you for putting them there in our lives to encourage us and to help us through the tough times. Father, in this moment, we remember our fathers and our father figures, those who are present and those who have passed away. May you honor their memory. And may we live in such a way that we can lend our lives to others to make their lives better. Lord, we pray for those that are without father figures. We pray for those that are seeking a forever home. Those foster children that need love and care and especially guidance and instruction and encouragement. Thank you so much for the organizations here in Hot Springs. The call and, and others that encourage young people because they need that encouragement today, especially in this life. Father, we're, we're praying for the turmoil that's going on in our world right now, and especially in the United States of America. Forgive us for the racial divide that has continued to deepen over the years, and forgive us if any of us have added to that division, deepening the chasm. Help us to be the agents of change, to begin in our actions to truly 
do justice and to love mercy, walking humbly with you. Help us to erase the divides that have been present for so long and help us to be the avenues that would cause love and understanding, forgiveness, and indeed reconciliation. Father, for the damage that's been done in the recent weeks because of injustice, it cannot be undone, but we can begin to do the repair. So I pray, Father, that you use us in whatever way. Show us, Holy Spirit, how we can change to make certain that all lives matter, not just to you, but here in this world. Lord, we are praying for families that are going through struggles right now. We pray for families that are without a provider. I think back to the devotional in the upper room from this past Thursday about losing that provision from a father figure and that provision as a pro being able to, to provide a, a roof and a food and clothing. And Lord, we pray for those folks that are struggling financially right now. We pray for those that have been downsized and are struggling financially. We pray that somehow you would allow others to become aware of their circumstance and that they would give generously to help others that are right now on their knees and begging for help. Lord, I pray for all that are physically hurting, especially those that are anticipating surgery or recovering from surgery. We ask you to bless those and their caregivers. Always be with those that are struggling with cancer and give their caregivers a special, a special dose of patience. Father, I want to pray again for our law enforcement officers and our military personnel right now with all of the tension that's going on in our world and in our country. I pray that you would give them divine protection. Father, I pray that you would give a spirit of understanding in the midst of such confusion. Help us to recognize and to see the truth that it is Satan, the liar from of old, that is causing this confusion and the tension in our lives. Help us to put the demons at bay and to put you back on your throne, to allow you and your Holy Spirit to guide us through this very, very tense time. Father, we pray that a cure, a vaccination would be discovered for this COVID-19 so we can stop living in fear. Father, I pray that you allow us to continue to practice social distancing and all of the hygiene that we must practice in order to keep the curve low. And so until such time as we can gather together, Lord, ask that in your mercy you hear our prayers and you hear us pray aloud now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Now we come to the part of our service where we give our tithes and our offerings. You can do these one of three ways, either online, you can text it, or you can send in your check to the church. And now, now we'll continue with our service. I just wanted to say that I love you and that I'm thankful for all that you do for me and my sister. And one of my favorite things that I get to do is come watch you out at the ballpark. Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! We love you! Happy Father's Day! Everyone! Everyone! 
Hey Dad, we just want to thank you for everything you do. Hey Daddy, we love you. Have a great day. Happy, happy Father's, Father's day. day. Hey Dad, Happy Father's Day. Um, I just wanted to thank you for everything that you do for this family. You're so supportive in me and my brother's sports and school and I really love you. So, Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you for teaching me how to fish and always take me to the lake when I want to go. Happy Father's Day. I love you. Hey Dad. hey, Dad. Thanks for teaching us how to go camping. Thanks for all the silly dances. Thanks for the gas money. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. We love you. I love you. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. We love you. Thank you for all that you do for us. We love you and hope you have a great day. And thank you for all the support you give us and the family that you built us and the roof over our head. We love you. Love you. As you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I Well, it's time for the message, and this is a Father's Day message. I'm always a bit apprehensive to bring the Father's Day message for a number of reasons. First of all, some of us have not had a good childhood. Some of us, unfortunately, were fathered by perhaps a dad that wasn't present, or may have been present physically, but was not present emotionally. Some of us have even suffered abuse at the hands or actually at the voice, emotional abuse from our father or a father figure. And sometimes those fathers that have passed away leave a void. And Father's Day is not happy for every person. So I'm always a bit apprehensive about sharing a Father's Day message. From, from my own perspective, I have some regrets as well. I, I am wearing my Winnie the Pooh and Tigger tie today. See, I would love for my kids to remember me either as Tigger, a guy that always liked to have fun, or Winnie the Pooh, a caring and compassionate person. But here's the truth. My kids probably remember me most as Rabbit. Yeah, it's sad to say, but I have to admit. You know, Rabbit is that negative personality in the Winnie the Pooh series and in the Hundred Acre Wood. And, and it's just sad with the adventures of Christopher Robin that they had to be a figure like Rabbit that always seemed to be negative. Truth be known, my family can probably tell you. Oftentimes, I see the negative before I see the positive. I, I don't want my kids to remember me like that or my wife. And I'm trying to change. So, dads, I just want to say, during this Father's Day message, there's hope for all of us. And I do want to take our focus from our biological fathers to our Father in heaven. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I do hope you have them, turn first to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. 
You can turn to chapter 14. I want to get to chapter 17, but if you begin in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, I want to point something out about Jesus and His relationship with our Father in heaven. In John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, I would like for you to take time after the worship service and after the message to actually read it slowly, methodically, and count the number of times Jesus refers to God as Father. Chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. Jesus has already given us a picture of heaven, not as just the heavenly realm, but as a place where we are comforted because we have the perfect Father as head of the house, in my Father's house. Uh, continue on. This, this, Father, Father, Father. I'm in verse 9. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is making a connection between His righteous living and the pattern that His Father in heaven has set. Down here in verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit. If you read through here, it's Father language, Father language, Father language in chapter 15, chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, this is a prayer. The entire chapter 17 is a prayer that Jesus is praying on behalf of the disciples. And I would say on behalf of us as well as Jesus' followers. And the word repetitively is Jesus focusing on Father. Chapter 17 and verse 1. After Jesus had spoken these words, He looked up to heaven and He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son so that the Son may glorify You. Drop down to verse 11 now. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are coming. They are in the world. And I am coming to You, to You, Holy Father. He calls God not just Father, but Holy Father. I drop down a little bit further in, in verse 25. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. Father, Father, Father. Jesus has a perfect relationship with His Father in heaven. I want to ask you a question right now. Do you have that kind of relationship with God the Father? Because Jesus modeled it for that. I know that Jesus is God's only begotten Son. So it seems as though Jesus should have kind of a special calling and a special relationship with God the Father. But Jesus came to live in the flesh to teach us. We too can have that most intimate relationship with God, our Father in heaven, who is the perfect Father. In the meantime, we need to figure out how to get along with our fathers here on this earth and how to be fathers ourselves So I want to take you now to the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs, we have so much insight into how to rear our children, how to be a father, how to relate to one another. So turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Are you there? Okay, Proverbs chapter 1. Drop down to verse 8. Verse 8 in Proverbs chapter 1. Hear, my child, your father's instructions... And do not reject your mother's teaching. You know, when we talk about a father, we have to include mother because you really can't have kids with the father alone. You've got to have a father and a mother. But I do want to focus on dads today. I want to focus on this verse 8. Hear, my child, your father's instructions. Do you know what active listening is? I teach active listening to couples that come to my office for marriage counseling. Active listening is when you... You listen to a person and then you repeat back what you heard them say so that there is communication clarity. I believe oftentimes in our rearing children and in children coming into adulthood, we don't always hear what our father says. I mean, we don't really listen. In this passage, listen carefully, hear what the father says. For instance, if your dad says to you as you're about to go out on Friday evening, with your own car, and your father says, I want you to be in the house by 11 o'clock tonight. That's your curfew. Don't miss it. Now, if we were to practice active listening, and I would ask you to repeat back, 
What did you just hear your father said? Many of you teenagers would say, well, I just heard him say I've got to be back at 11 o'clock because he doesn't want me to have any fun because I've got to be back in here before cure for you. So he really doesn't want me to go out and have a good time. That's what I heard him say. No, see, that's not what your father was saying. That's not his instruction. If we ask the father to repeat himself, what did you really say when you said you wanted your child in by 11 o'clock? That's curfew time. Well, what I'm really saying is I'm concerned for their safety. And truth be known, after 1030 at night, you're starting to become a little tired and you're starting to make decisions that are unfortunately infused with, well, the rest of the folks that are out at 11 o'clock at night. And sometimes you might not make the wisest decisions. So I'm really concerned for your safety and your welfare. And I'd rather have you home under my roof at 11 o'clock at night. You see, if we really listen to what our fathers are saying, really hear it could be that our fathers are giving us loving admonition, instructions that will assist us in our life. Again, hear, my child, your father's instruction. That means active listening. I want to encourage you. Kids, when your dad's trying to give you some instructions, just stop for a moment and say, Dad, if I hear what you're saying, you're asking me to, and repeat back. Oftentimes, I would just guess you didn't really hear what your father had to say. And by practicing active listening, you're probably going to be on the same page more often than not. The next proverb that I'd ask for you to turn to is Proverb chapter 10. Proverb chapter 10. Let's go to Proverb chapter 10, verse 1. Verse 1, chapter 10. Here it is. A wise child makes a glad father, but a foolish child is a mother's grief. You know, both moms and dads fret over kids, no matter if they're toddlers or teenagers or well into adulthood. Parents can't help but fret over their kids. Now, now moms, I think you all carry a big, big burden. You have borne the children, and regardless of their age, I've seen moms that just wring their hands over their children. They are just so worried, and, and, and I think that that's what moms do. Believe it or not, dads do the same thing. They just do it a little differently. They might not wring their hands and fret, but dads kind of pace. Now, they might not pace physically, walking back and forth, but, but they kind of pace in their head because here's the truth. Dads pace so they can process information. They have to put everything in a box. This is what it, There's a book that I've read, and I've shared it with some marriage couples that are looking for counseling, and, and, and it says uh, men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. In other words, women and the way they process information, it all comes together like a plate of spaghetti all mixed around on your plate. Men are like waffles. They have to put everything in each one of those little squares to process that. Now, that's not always the case, but by and large, dads, they have to put things in space. And here's the truth. Most dads are carrying a lot of stress to begin with. In, in most of our homes, not all, but in many of our homes, the father is the main breadwinner. That means that he has a stressful job. His job might not be stressful alone, but if he is the breadwinner, it comes with added responsibility, and chances are the job alone that a dad's carrying is stressful. So he always has stress at work. He doesn't want to bring that stress home. And sometimes the home situation makes his life more stressful. And he really doesn't want to fret or pace, he would really like his kids to be making great, wise decisions. And if he doesn't have to worry or be anxious or fret about his children, regardless of their age, a wise child makes a glad father. If you had a choice to make your dad more stressed in his life or to make your father glad and happy, which would you choose? I know my kids would want to make me happy. And truth be known, if they make good decisions, if, if they live out their life in the best possible fashion in which my wife and I have reared them, they're going to make me less stressed, which makes me glad. It makes more sense to me. So regardless of your age, if you can make your dad happy in your decision making, I think that that's a good proverb. A wise child makes a glad father. And that just makes good sense. All right, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23. 
Proverbs chapter 23. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Beginning with verse 22 in chapter 23. Here it is, verse 22. Listen to your father who begot you. And do not despise your mother when she is old. Don't despise your mom when she gets older. And, and, and you know what? Here's the truth. Kids start to disagree with moms as they get older. When, when they're younger, they just say mom or whatever because mom's fixing their knees and helping them and, and helping them with their homework. They're doing, they just kind of trust mom. But as we get older, we start to disagree with moms. And we really shouldn't do that. We should love them in our old age. But we should listen to the father who begot you. Now, it's interesting that that word in there, it, it doesn't say the father who sired you. It's, you know, I believe the intention of the proverb writer here helps us have an understanding that many of us have father figures that they may not be our biological fathers, but they have begot us like a person that's adopted into the family or a father that's taken under his wing some person that needs that man's tutelage, a, an, an uncle, a Sunday school teacher, a, a, a person that is a father figure. Listen to them. They may not be your biological father, but they love you and they have good instruction for your lives. By the way, those persons that are older than us have experienced more life than we. It just makes good sense to listen to those father figures. Now, I want to continue to read on in this proverb, verse 23. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom and instruction and understanding. And others, continue to accumulate wisdom in your years. Verse 24. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. Rejoice. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. Here's the truth. When my kids come to faith in God, when I see them start to put their lives in God's hands, I rejoice. I am celebrating. And it's not always been that way with my kids. They've had to learn their own faith. Rita and I cannot just vicariously thrust our faith into them. We've brought them to church. We've prayed with and for them. We've taught them the holy word of the Bible. But here's the bottom line. They have to come to faith on their own. And when they come to faith on their own, woo, I get excited. Here's the truth. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. Let me tell you, some of you parents and fathers, you might be quite anxious about where your children are, especially your adult children who have yet come to faith. I want to say, let your heart not be troubled. God has a plan and he loves them. Our, our heavenly father loves them even more than you do. And he's laid out the groundwork. He has given them the prevenient grace. And when they finally receive that grace, they're going to come back home. They're going to come back home to the Father's love and you will discover how much God loves them and then you'll be able to rejoice. The Father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who begots a wise son will be glad in him. When, when, when someone chooses Christ, you'll be glad that you have helped them make that decision. Let your father and your mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. I want to tell you, children... Young adults, older adults, there is no greater joy for a Christian family and a father when their kids come to faith. We pray for our children all the time, daily. Continue to pray for your kids, especially if you haven't seen evidence that they've come to faith in Christ yet. Do not give up. Continue to pray. There will come an opportunity for them to receive the love of the Father through the sacrifice of our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And when that day comes, believe me, you're going to rejoice and you will be glad. Now, I want to move away from Proverbs because I'd like to talk about what's going on in our world right now and we cannot escape it. The racial tension that we're experiencing as a country, it's affecting everything that happens in our country right now, even more so than our isolation because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to take us to the book of Malachi. Malachi, it's the last book in the Bible before the New Testament. It's the last prophet that's recorded before we get to Matthew. So turn to that last book in the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi. When you finally get to Malachi, turn to chapter 2, chapter 2 in Malachi, and then we want to begin with verse 10, verse 10. So Malachi 2 and verse 10. These ancient words, I believe, have an understanding for us, 
both in the racial tension that's happening in our world, but also to get a refocus on where our priorities should be. Verse 10, here's the question. Have we not all one Father? Has not God created us? We are made in the image of God. Black, white, tall, short, male, female. We are all made in the imago Dei. That, that is the image of God. Every one of us has one Father, and that is God. I don't know how this separation and segregation began. I believe it's Satan's plan to eradicate and erase that we are all one family under God. God is our heavenly Father. He created us in His image. And He loves us unconditionally. And until we put God back as our one Father, we're going to continue to be divided racially, generationally, sexually. God is our Father who loves us unconditionally. Now, you can read this passage on your own, and I would encourage you to do, because there are some, some tense topics in there that are hot-button topics for Christians around the world and in our country. But if we dare, dare to even touch on them, the prophet Malachi speaks of them. For instance, in verse 14, uh, why do you ask? You ask, uh, why does he not? Because the Lord is a witness between you and the wife of your youth. This is talking about infidelity. To whom you have been faithless. God is the faithful father and he wants us in our marriage relationships to be faithful. Though she was your companion and your wife by covenant. Did not God make her? Both flesh and spirit are his. What does the one God desire? What does God want? And here is the answer. God wants godly offspring. If you ask God, what could he want since he created male and female and created us in the image of God? What could God want from us? What, what's the one thing? To create godly offspring. To, he told us to go and procreate, to, to, to make more human beings. He gave us that gift. It's a miraculous gift he gave to us. And we are all made in the image of God. I want to close this, this message because there's a video that I would like for you to watch. Now, now the video was created to reemphasize some of the things that as Christians, we, we hold some differing views. And, and some of the conservative views might not, well, it might not, gravitate to you. Some of us might lean a little bit more liberally, and I apologize for that. Uh, you have your own views, and you can stay right there, but I believe the message of this video is important for today. And I'm asking you to not let those issues that you see on the video trip you up so you do not listen to the one message that I think is the, the tying factor in this video that you're about to watch. And the tying factor is that we are all created in the image of God, imago Dei. We have one Father. One Father. The conclusion of chapter 2 actually has this question. Where is the God of justice? That's what's going on in our world right now, especially in the United States. There's injustice going on everywhere. Where's the God of justice? Why can't He write the justice? You know why? God cannot write the justice because we have forgotten that we have one Father, that we are one family. If we will ever get back on the same page. And to remember, we have, uh, on this Father's Day, remember, we have a Father in heaven. He created all of us to be kin, to be family. And it doesn't matter the color of our skin, our racial ethnicity, our socioeconomic status. We're family, one family. Do families have disagreements? Oh, yes. Do families sometimes go through a period where they're not going to speak to one another? Oh, yes. But when tragedy happens, when crisis occurs, those families are brought back together because there's something that's tying them together that's so strong. We are tied together, my friends, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the one and only begotten Son of God our Father. And He came from heaven to earth to tell us, to remind us, we are one. We are one in God as our Father. On this Father's Day, I hope we are reminded of that message. 
we begin to reconcile one to another because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. God is our heavenly and holy Father. I pray that we begin to reconcile the family to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, God bless you all. The canvas of God's love is broad. But as Christians exercise the love of God in the world, one common thread holds it all together. The Christian story speaks of a mystery that lies deep in the soul of every human being. In the beginning, God in all his power and creativity reached down to craft a world that reflects his glory. By his word, he spoke the planets into existence. But with his hands and his breath, he sculpted men and women unlike anything else. The scriptures tell us that human beings were God's masterwork. And he wrote his signature, set his imprint on the human soul. Humans are created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. We have the ability to create, worship, communicate, reason, and relate. We are capable of love and responsible for our actions. The Christian story also tells us that humankind, created for intimacy with God, rejected God instead. Created to reflect Him, we sought to replace Him. This sin brought death and destruction into the world. But the fall is not the end of the story. For God sent a Redeemer, the perfect image of the invisible God, who took the fractured pieces of our humanity and bound them up, restoring the broken image of God and renewing our lost fellowship with Him. This, the image of God, changes everything. It shapes how we see the world and one another and calls us to honor the image of God in everyone. Christians work to alleviate poverty, disease, and starvation because even the poorest of the poor are created by God in the image of God. Christians work to rescue and rehabilitate abducted and trafficked girls and boys because there is no such thing as a disposable human being created by God and in God's image. Christians fight abortion because children created by God in the image of God should not be terminated and discarded and because mothers created by God and in God's image deserve our care. Christians uphold the dignity of the elderly and disabled because all who are created by God in His image are fearfully and wonderfully made and dear to Him. Christians work on behalf of all immigrants because they too are created by God in the image of God and should be welcomed as we would welcome Christ. Christians work for religious liberty because the freedom to follow one's conscience is part of what it means to be created by God in the image of God. Christians work for the flourishing of marriage because it's an instrument of blessing for women and men created by God in the image of God and the essential building block of a flourishing society. Christians work for racial unity and reconciliation because all people created by God in the image of God share something much deeper than skin color. In short, there has never been a human being who was not created by God in God's image. And that's what animates everything we do, the common thread that holds it all together. God's image compels God's children to love all people. The world is broken. We yearn for the day when Christ will make all things new. But for today, we do what we do. We strive for justice and dignity, liberty and flourishing because every person who bears the stamp of God matters to God and matters to us.